We're still looking at cell on proper names, and uh, today I want to begin by going over the um, points about informative identities and the cluster theory that we were looking at last time. Um, so uh, on cell's kind of picture, and this is quite plausible, you see why he says this, that if you've got a name in your vocabulary, you understand this name, then what's fixing the reference to the name is typically not what you think, but the cluster of descriptions associated with that name by the community. So you're not quite in charge of the word, you're using the name the same way everyone else uses it. And that's obviously so for names of people in, um, in public life, for people that you talk about from uh, uh, the news. Oh my God. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> of course it does. These things don't just happen. Let's take it from the top. Um, so this is theory of meaning. <laughs> we're going to do the cell thing. Um, and uh, we're talking about how... In we're talking about how informative identities have to do with what the individual's take on the object is. And uh, on the other hand, the reference of a name on Searle's picture is getting fixed by the community. I mean, it's certainly possible that uh, you could associate the same descriptions with two names, but wonder whether the community does. That's to say, if you take a remark like Tully is, is Cicero, actually, I, I never heard of Tully and Cicero outside the context of um, philosophy examples. I, I don't wish to seem like some barbarian, but that, that, there you go, that's the truth. And um, if you ask me what I associate with the name Tully, it's some Greek. And if you ask me what I associate with the name Cicero, it's some Greek. <laughs> um, so I associate... <laughs> I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I associate the same descriptions with both of them. Yeah, But still in all, I can wonder, well, maybe the people who know about these things don't associate the same descriptions with both of them. So it's certainly not true that I'd say that's an uninformative identity that Tully is Cicero. Really, and what you want to say is I know too little about it for that to be either informative or uninformative. Um, there's another kind of example that uh, Kripke introduced where um, you could have just one name. There's really only just one name here uh, being used by the community. And there's a single collection of descriptions associated with that name by the community. But you might wonder, is that really the same person? Is there just one person here? So just think for a moment how that might be possible. You've got a single name, like Bill Clinton or something like that. You've got a single cluster of descriptions associated with it in the community. It's the same kind of storm of gossip and news that follows Bill wherever he goes. Um, but uh, you might wonder, is it really one person? You might think it's not true that it's just one person here. I think, for example, if you were doing the, uh, some political history, you might say, um, I know about the movie star, Ronald Reagan, and I know about the president, Ronald Reagan, but it can't be one and the same person. I mean, this isn't um, Renaissance Italy. How could there be two people who combined these movie acting abilities and these uh, presidential capacities in the one frame. I mean, in the community is common knowledge that is one and the same person. But you might say, how could that be? The great movie star can't be the same person as the person who defeated the evil empire. 
So when you say Reagan starred in that Western, and when you say Reagan was president in 1981, you just must be talking about two different people. That's not altogether irrational. I mean, how could, <laughs> that's a question that occurred to many people across the world. How could that have happened? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? So when you say, here's the movie actor, and here's the decisive president, how could it be one and the same person? It could be not just informative, it could be a bombshell to be told that really is one and the same person. Right? So even although it's a single name with a single cluster of descriptions associated with it circulating in the community, when you are using that name, it could be informative to you to be told that Reagan, the movie actor, is Reagan, the um, politician. It could be informative to you to be told is one and the same person. So you can't just read off informativeness or uninformativeness from whether it's a single cluster of descriptions circulating in the community. Yeah? I mean, once you see how this kind of example works, is it plain how this kind of example works? You, you, can, gen you can start generating more. I mean, suppose you think further about the history of California. Um, you're thinking about Reagan, and you think, well, what fixes reference? What fixes reference for these two signs is the same for both. But a single thoughtful individual might find the identity informative. And then you think, well, what about Schwarzenegger? How could that have happened? It can't be the same person. That, that, that couldn't really happen. But, uh, so it's going to be uninformative for you. But I don't know, maybe this is going too far into political theory or um, <laughs> Californian political theory. Um, okay? So there's a kind of disconnect between the way the reference of the name is being fixed and what's informative or uninformative for you. So I think when you bear this kind of point in mind, if you look carefully at what Searle is saying in that article about informativeness and uninformativeness, really none of it actually seems to work. And here is a, 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 a Searle uh, on informativeness. He says, consider your original identity. Tully is Cicero. A statement made using this sentence would, I suggest, be analytic for most people. The same descriptive presuppositions are associated with the name. But it's right to say that for most people, if, assuming I'm typical, the same descriptive presuppositions are associated with the name, because we all associate something very minimal with it, like some Greek. Um, but that doesn't mean we regard this as trivial or analytic or a priori. Well, that must definitely be true. I mean, otherwise, all the names of Greek um, figures that you've dimly heard, you'd regard all those identities as analytic. That can't be right. Yeah? So, Seller is assuming that the identity is uninformative when the speaker associates the same descriptions with the two uses of the name. That would only work, you can see why he says that, but that would only work if it was which descriptions you associate with the name that's fixing reference. But the whole point of a social theory is that it's not what you think about the reference of the name that matters, it's what's going on in the community from which the language comes. It's a socially determined cluster of descriptions that is fixing the reference. So two terms could have two differently socially, different socially determined clusters associated with them, like Tully and Cicero. Maybe the Greek scholars all think they are very different, and maybe nowadays it's thought actually they were different people. But I, as an individual, might be associating the same descriptions <coughs> with the two names. Okay, so that's just to walk through some of the points that we were talking about last time, about um, how difficult it is to have both the socially determined character of reference fixing and um, an account of meaning that's going to explain informativeness versus uninformativeness, in informativeness versus uninformativeness of identity. 
Is that plain as day? Oh, there's seats right over here. Yeah. Yep? Uh, so just to, to clarify, so sure. I'll give examples of how something with the same name, like Reagan equals Reagan, can be informative, but something with even different names, like Kelly equals Sister Girl, can be uninformative. Uh, so you can counter examples of each just No, or, yeah. The, the Reagan is Reagan kind of thing is not subtle, right? Um, but uh, in that Right. I'm putting that forward as a point about how difficult life is for Cell. Um, so I'm putting this forward as a criticism of Cell, really, because um, how should I put this? Okay. Um, so you've got the individual here. This is how I think of it. So I may, <laughs> I may as well draw it. Here is the individual. Here is the cluster of descriptions associated with, with the name in the community. Yeah. Uh, so that's the cluster associated with the name in the community. The individual tries to tap into that cluster of descriptions, tries to take on board as much as they can. Um, so what do you say about when an identity is uninformative? Well, there are two things you could say. One is, is uninformative that A is B? If I associate the same descriptions with A as with B, right, that's one possibility. That would be the wrong answer. What about that? You see that that's, first of all, that's one possible answer. If you've got this Frege's puzzle, when is, in his, is an identity uninformative? Let, let me take this slowly. When is an identity informative or uninformative? Right? So I raise that question about this, A is B. That's OK. Yeah, happy with that. Here is one answer. Is uninformative for me if I associate the same descriptions with A as I do with B, right? That must be the wrong answer because of what I was saying about Tully and Cicero. I associate the same descriptions with Tully as I do with Cicero, some Greek. But I don't regard that at all as meaning that the identity is uninformative. Yeah, I have no idea whether it's true or not that Tully is Cicero. I mean, someone... I mean, I read it in the books, but uh, uh, that's informative. Yeah? That's okay? So what are you going to do? Well, you could say um, the identity is uninformative if it's the same cluster of descriptions fixing the reference of A as fixes the reference of B. But that's uh, uh, the Reagan is Reagan example. Those two uses of the name Reagan are both associated with the same cluster of descriptions in the community. Out there in the real world, political commentators and uh, journalists and so on don't make a distinction. They just use the name Reagan indifferently for the movie actor or the politician. Yeah? I mean, for any of us with rich or complex lives, our names have got this rich collection of descriptions associated with them. Um, so, but that identity, Reagan is Reagan, can be informative for an individual, even though it's the same cluster of descriptions fixing the reference in the community. So how are you going to explain when, when an identity is uninformative? You can't do it. There aren't any pieces here that would let you explain that. It's a really hard question. Uh, yeah? Yeah, you could say the Greek call. Well, in that case, if, if you make it like that, then um, um, there probably aren't any definite descriptions I associate with Tully and with Cicero. I mean, I don't, the suggests uniqueness. Right? And I don't think I know anything that would be unique about them. Maybe they weren't even called Tully or Cicero. You, you see what I mean? Maybe the Greeks called them something quite different. I, you know, <laughs> I don't wish to completely destroy my credibility here, but I, I have no idea, uh, frankly, what the Greeks called them, or if that, those names were invented in the 19th century or something. Yeah? So in that case, I'd have to say, well, I associate with Tully zero definite descriptions and with Cicero, zero definite descriptions. So that's the same. Doesn't make it uninformative that Tully is Cicero. Yeah. Or even if there is something, you know, 
um, uh, won the battle of Xerxes or something like that. Uh, then um, th th that's, uh, even if I got one definite description I associate with each, that's not going to mean um, I regard the identity as informative if it's the same, if it's different definite descriptions. Because these might be just two stray things that everybody who knows anything about ancient Greece knows that it's actually one and the same person. These are just notational variants, these two names. They're just, really, when you trace it back, they're just different ways of spelling the same thing. That could be, it could really be um, a trivial thing that Tully is Cicero. Yeah, for, all, for all you can tell looking at what descriptions I associate with the names. Uh, yep, yeah. one, two. Uh, if it's an a priori truth, it's, um, that's right, if it's an a priori truth, it doesn't really depend which individual it is, yep. But my, my point is, informativeness seems to, is it, known, if it's knowable a priori, it, knowledge is a characteristic of an individual. Is the individual that knows or not. So in that sense, it's a property of individuals. Whether the, uh, because you are, you're talking about whether an individual can know this a priori. Yeah? Um, and my point here is that whether an individual can know this a priori is not determined by what's going on in the society at large. Because what's going on in the society at large is one thing, and what's going on in my head is another. Yeah? But for knowledge, what's going on in my head, it seems to be very important. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm sure Cyril would say it doesn't make his life hard. <laughs> um, the trouble is, Cyril is trying to explain Frege's puzzle about informative versus uninformative identities. Um, and, you know, when you look at the, as, as you go through the, the article, if you, you have to look quite carefully, but you will find various remarks there about um, how this approach in terms of socially determined clusters of descriptions, fixing reference, allows you to um, explain which identities are informative and which identities are uninformative. And my point is it doesn't, because looking at the level of the whole socially determined cluster means that, well, in the case of Reagan or Schwarzenegger, you've got one socially determined cluster, fixing reference, but the identity could be informative. Yeah? Um, and if you look at the level of the individual, uh, the, the, uh, of what's going on with things like Tully or Cicero, then the person associating the same descriptions with the two names doesn't make the identity informative. Um, sorry, uninformative. Yes. Um, uh, so he doesn't have enough pieces there to explain the distinction between informative and uninformative identities. It was all right, so long as you thought a, we're just thinking in terms of the language of a single individual and the descriptions associated with a name by that individual as fixing reference. Then you could say, if I associate the same descriptions with two, with two uses of a name, then it must be the same thing, and otherwise the identity is uninformative. Yeah. At one level, that works just fine, that picture. But once you go social, you really are caught. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't want to deny, I mean, it does go back to the question, because I was saying, well, knowledge is something the individual has. Yeah? But when people are talking about scientific developments, well, we now know that the Higgs boson exists, and you're not talking about um, the knowledge any one individual has. You're talking about the knowledge that the community as a whole has. 
Yeah. So it's something like that. Then you might be indeed be able to say, um, well, we know this or we know that, uh, and talk about knowledge as something that the collective has. We now know that Tully is Cicero, or that Tully was not Cicero. Yeah. Um, the thing is, that was not how Frege stated it. Yeah. Um, Frege's problem was about the knowledge an individual has. Yeah. Uh, it hadn't occurred to me actually to think of working through these puzzles about informativeness and uninformativeness at the level of the community. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say what would be a priori at the level of the community. I mean, for most people, was it a hard-won discovery that this um, uh, uh, successful politician was indeed the movie actor? You know, were most people aghast when that was pointed out? Or um, was it pretty generally known the whole time? There are going to be difficult questions there. With Tully as Cicero, was the community of ancient historians um, enthralled by the discovery that Tully is Cicero? Or was it something that everybody has known since work on ancient Greece began? Yeah. It's going to be a little bit difficult to know how these distinctions work out at the level of a community. But anyway, Frege's puzzle was not pitched at the level of community knowledge. Frege's puzzle was pitched at the level of um, the knowledge an individual has. Is this a priori or not? Yeah. But it's worth thinking through that. Um, did, did you? Uh, okay. Okay, you see how, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, if, if, if I'm going to use a name like Bill Clinton and tell you all kinds of scandalous stories about Bill Clinton, um, if at the end of the day it suddenly turned out I was using Bill Clinton as a name for my next door neighbor, um, I, could, you know, I could still be sued. But it really wouldn't help. I don't have that right to just associate any description I like with a name. That's right. You do your best. That's right. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to take on board as much of this as you reasonably can. That's right. You, yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, if you're going to be responsible in, in your use of language, that's what I mean about that Bill Clinton example I just gave. You've got to be responsible in your use of language. And that is a matter of um, trying to tap into what's going on socially. Yeah. Um, but th in a way, the question about informativeness or in uninformativeness comes up after you've done that after you've acquired a mastery of the name, which identities are going to be informative and which are going to be uninformative. Yeah. Yeah. But it's important to think about the mechanics of the process you're describing. OK. OK, well, for, for just a minute now, I want to kind of pan back and look at the kind of framework in which we're thinking about language here. So this is a really important idea that for the moment is guiding everything we do that knowing the meaning of a statement is knowing what has to be the case for it to be true. I'm genuinely puzzled as to how much plainer I can make that, and I really don't know if that seems immediately plausible as it stands, or if it seems kind of like a baffling remark, and you think, why did he say that? Can you put your hand up if that seems reasonable enough? Put your hand up if that seems kind of baffling. Yeah, I mean, so can you put your hand up if that, if that seems kind of baffling? Knowing the meaning of a statement is knowing what has to be the case for it to be true. 
It's, it may be a mark of great intelligence to find it baffling. I'm not, you know, it's, it's not that you're not getting something. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm very glad that some, many of you find this intuitive enough. Um, well, I, I, I gave this example. You take some statement you don't know the meaning of at all. La neige, well, let's suppose la neige blanche. Yeah. And then I tell you what it takes for that to be true. That would be true just in case snow is white. Now, do you understand the remark? That's right. I'm just talking about the meaning of a statement. I'm not talking about the meaning of an individual word. I would think that the meaning of a statement or the meaning of a word would have something more to do with each other. That's right. The meaning of a statement and the meaning of a word must be connected. That's, that's the, the second sentence I'm going to come on to. But right now, I'm only talking about the meaning of a whole statement. Yeah? Okay. Uh, wonderful. Okay. We will come back to this. I just want to touch base on um, how intuitive that is. But if knowing the meaning of a statement um, uh, is a matter of uh, knowing what has to be the case for it to be true, well, words have their meanings by contributing to the truth values of statements. Right? I mean, a statement has got lots of individual words in it, and you understand what the meaning is of an individual word when you know what difference is making to the truth or falsity of the whole statement. Yeah? I mean, that's really just what the last comments have said, that um, there's got to be a connection between the meaning of a word and the meaning of a statement. And this second sentence here is just saying, um, the meaning of a term is what contribution it makes to determining the truth or falsity of a sentence containing it. There's no more to... I'm using semantic value there. That's not a term that's used in the um, literature uh, that we're looking at, but the sem th this is just a definition of semantic value. Semantic value of a term is a contribution it makes to determining the truth or falsity of a statement containing it. So take, for example, suppose you take Sally. Is that a singular term or a general term? Singular. Is tall. General, very good. Um, so what, is, what difference does Sally make to the truth or falsity of a statement containing it? How does Sally have a semantic value? The answers here are, are very, very simple. Um, and, what is this, and what is the semantic value going to be of is tall? How does is tall make a difference to the truth or falsity of a statement containing it? You, you have a shot? No one has a shot? Okay, the, uh, you, you're probably thinking the answer. The thing, I, I would like you to think about this for just a second. What is the semantic value of Sally? What is the semantic value of Isitol? How do these terms make a difference to the truth or falsity of statements containing them? Okay, in the case of Sally, a singular term has a semantic value. A singular term makes a difference to the truth or falsity of a statement containing it by standing for an object. I mean, that's the reason you're not thinking of this is it's so obvious once you spell it out. At least I think it is. What I mean is, if you take a statement, Sally is tall. Sally... Um, uh, Sally is wearing a coat, um, then what do the truth or falsity of those sentences depend on? They depend on how things are with that concrete thing, Sally. They depend, the truth or falsity of those sentences depends on whether Sally's tall, whether Sally's wearing a coat. Yep. Uh, I, I, the, 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 the way I've explained it so far, having a semantic value and having a meaning are the same thing.
Yes, that's right. Uh huh. <laughs> a child learns about more. Okay. Yes. Right. The truth of. That's very good. Okay, l l let me put that into a little bit of context. Uh, um, um, there are lots of things you can do with words besides saying how things are. You can say, well, how is Bill? Um, or if you just meet, see someone, you, uh, you can say, Sally! Right? These things don't have truth values. Yeah, if you come in and you say good morning, what's your truth value? Right? Um, but the a background idea here is, note that um, there's something basic about the fact-stating use of language. Yeah. So that if you take a, 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 something like a command to shut the door, yeah, or stating that the door is shut, or if I say, put the lights on, yeah. well, take the assertion, are the lights on? Suppose I explain to you what the meaning of that is in terms of, uh, are the light, so, sorry, suppose I explain to you the meaning of the lights are on, yeah? So now you know what, how, what all those words mean, now you know how to use them in a statement. And then you say, uh, and now I say to you, well, could you put those lights on? And you say, but I have no idea what that means. All I understood, you, all you told me about was how to use those words in a test or a command. Or if I say to you, are the lights on? You say, yeah, but... I only know about the fact-stating use of words. Yeah. I don't know about um, how, do, how they're used in, in uh, questions. There's something crazy about that. I mean, the, the, once you know how the words figure to fact-state, then you know how to use them in questions or commands. That, come back, I, I, I just want to get to your more example because it's a great example. So you've got a child saying more, yeah? then the child can, keep say, well, can say more, and that's like a, qu a request or a command. Yeah? And you give the child more. I mean, th th this is not theoretical. You give the child more, and the child says, more. And you say, that is more. I just gave you more. Yeah. Right? Um, and you can certainly have a child at a level where it knows to say more uh, when it wants more. But it doesn't have it, the fact-stating thing. That is more. You've got plenty there. That's more. Yeah? Um, and that's what I mean. There's some sense in which the child doesn't really understand more. It doesn't know what it is for there to be more there. Yeah? Until it's got it, when it can say, yeah, now I've got more. Or, now I still don't have more. You see what I mean? But come back. I'm, I'm, I'm not try I, I just wanted to get to your more example. I don't want to. Yeah. Um, more. Yes. <laughs> Good choice. Yes. It was the only word he knew. Yes. Right. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that might well be true. That might well be true that you kind of bootstrap your way into language by getting the requests first, yeah? by getting your negotiations about what you, what you need or want first. Um, but still in all, the structure that you're getting in the language is defined ultimately by what's going on at the fact-stating level. There's how you get in, that's one question, and there's what you're getting into is another. And Excuse me. It's, it's, with that, it's with that second question, what you're getting into, that was, you see the appeal of the fact-sitting level being basic.
Okay. Okay. Um, um, so if that's semantic value, okay. So the semantic value of Sally, what's the semantic value of Sally? How does Sally make a difference to the truth or falsity of statements containing the name? By referring to something, right? That's what reference is. It's when you're making a difference to the truth or falsity of the sentence by standing for an object. If Stanley stands for one object, that's going to make one contribution to the sense of the, the to the truth condition of the sentence. If Sally stands for a different object, that will make a different contribution to the truth condition of the sentence. Um, what about is tall? Well, not to make a mystery of it. Um, I, I, I don't want you to talk too much over this, but is tall doesn't stand for an object. It has a semantic value quite, in quite a different way. And what you really need for a general term is that it's some kind of map from objects to truth values. So that you put in Sally there, that's, that's the name of one object, um, and the is tall maps that onto true. You put Bill in there, and the is tall maps it onto false. You see what I mean? This is a very simple idea, but it's a really basic idea that the meaning of a general term is a map from objects onto truth or falsity. Okay, what, <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute why I'm saying all this. Okay, but that's, that's about the general framework we're using here. So the general question we're, using, we're raising here is all about how singular terms get tied up to objects. And there are all these different kinds of singular terms we've been looking at. And Freig is saying the way it goes is that uh, the sign gets hooked up to the reference by the sense, whatever exactly that is. But it's getting onto the reference that's the important thing, because it's by having a reference that the name has um, a semantic value. Um, now, if you had a simple view where uh, you don't have the sense, you've just got the reference, then you couldn't have meaning without reference. If you had only no level of sense, but only the sign and the reference, you couldn't have meaning without reference. But the way I've just been describing it, you can't have meaning without reference anyway. Frege says, in grasping a sense, you're certainly not assured of a reference. If you take descriptions like the celestial body most distinct from the earth, or the least rapidly convergent series, you can have meaning without reference. But if meaning is truth condition, it's very hard to see how this works. So look, let, let me give so, uh, uh, an example. Suppose I, um, OK, so here we go. I'm going to give you a practical demonstration. I'm going to make some chalk marks on the board, and I'm going to give them names, OK? So um, here is one chalk mark. Let us call this a line. Right? Okay? That's okay. So now you know what line means. If I say, well, I guess line is over a foot long, or line is white, you know that the, the, these sentences are true or false. If I say to you, line shows a rare graphic ability, um, you might say, well, I guess, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, okay? So you understand line perfectly well. You know what contribution it's making to the truth or falsity of sentences containing it. Okay? Let me do it again. Suppose you take this series of dots. Anyone? Give it a name? <laughs> Does anyone want to give, be the one to give this a name? Dash. Very good. <laughs> OK. So now the name Dash. Now I've explained the meaning of the name Dash. OK? Shall we do it again? Oval. OK, very good. OK, so you understand the meanings of all those names, right? Now, let me do this just one last time. So um, here is smudge. OK. Um, is smudge, to take, take the statement, smudge is circular. You know what that means. You understand that all right. Smudge is rectangular. Smudge shows rare philosophical insight in the part of the author. 
Well, what I've done here is I've got a sign without a reference. Right? Because there's nothing here. It's not that you're missing something. There actually isn't anything there. Right? So I've explained the meaning of the name smudge in just the same way I explained the meaning of oval or dash or line. I just subtracted the reference. With oval and dash and line, I explained the meaning by saying low line, low dash, low oval. And I would smudge I do just the same way, low smudge, but there's just nothing there. But in that case, it's not that I have meaning without reference. You know perfectly well what the meaning is. It's just that the, the name happens to not refer to anything. You have no idea what I'm talking about. I mean, <laughs> even more than usual, right? <laughs> you really, in this case, you really just have no hope. I mean, there's really nothing I'm saying when I say smudge of these characteristics. Yeah? So how can a sign have meaning without reference? If the way a sign has meaning is by making a difference to the truth or falsity of a sentence containing it, then meaning without reference doesn't make any sense. Yep. Yeah, Frege has this example of the, the Reese Lapid rapidly convergent series. Yeah, you can understand that. That's right. Yeah, you look at all those uh, convergent series, and um, for every series you find, there is another one that is more rapidly convergent. Yeah? It's like the idea of the biggest number. For every number you find, there is a number bigger than it. So there's no such thing as the biggest number. Yeah? Um, OK, so there you have meaning without reference, all right. Yeah. So one question is, how can that be happening? Because reference is how the sign contributes to the truth or falsity of sentences containing it. But here you've got a sign that seems to have a meaning without having a reference. So how, how did, I mean, the real puzzle is this one. How did that happen? How come you got here a sign that has meaning? Um, but in this case, how should I say, in that case, the stage setting for the reference seems quite substantial. If you see what I mean, you've got this big description here. Um, in the case of these names, when I'm just saying law, that isn't enough stage setting. Uh, uh, something like that is the, that's the intuitive problem. There wasn't enough stage setting here for you to have any idea what the meaning is. Yep? Yeah. Right. Right. You, you mean you have some kind of associations in your head, something like that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, the reference is just the concrete object. Yeah. Ah, well, I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> joy, <laughs> no reference, yes, I, I, I would argue <laughs> that of course they have a reference, yeah, um, but the thing is, uh, concrete object, well, quite a concrete object, um, there is such a thing, right, that's, that, that's probably the right way to put it, there is such a thing, um, I, no, I, 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 the, the, that example is more like the biggest number. There is no such thing as the biggest number. Yeah, and rapidly, least rapidly convergent series is like that. There is no such thing as a least rapidly convergent series. Um, so the concrete object, I, I think that this actually goes back to what we're talking about with ideas, the associated ideas. When I write down smudge, you may have a whole bunch of free associations. Yeah? But the thing is that we wouldn't take your free associations or my free associations to either, either of them 
be definitive about the truth or falsity of the statement. Yeah. So if I say, well, what I, I, I imagine something shaped like a concertina. Well, all right, but that doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah, there, there really isn't any fact to the matter here. Is that me doing that or is that something else? I see, okay, so no matter. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yes. I think pi is a little bit different. I mean, there is such an... Well, uh, no, I, I, there is such a thing as infinity, too. Um, in fact, there are lots of infinities. That, 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 that's all right. Um, it's not a number, but that's a, a natural number, but that's a different thing. That's a different point. Yeah, yeah. When I, the thing that doesn't exist is the biggest natural number. You see what I mean? Um, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a perfectly reasonable question, and it's like that question about love. What are you talking about, an object? Yeah. Um, and uh, for present purposes, um, an object is something which, if you refer to it, it makes sentences containing that name determinately true or false. Okay. So that goes around in a circle but it's kind of an, an illuminating circle. But actually, we're, we're not going to just go away from these topics. I, I, I don't want to, uh, we're going to go on into the much, in much more depth uh, the next couple of times looking at Russell. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>